So, rarely is an area of science represented so well by one person. But that's the case with Dame Jane Goodall, the world's leading primatologist and the leading expert, among other things, on chimpanzees. Founder of the Jane Goodall Institute, Jane has worked extensively on conservation and animal welfare. She's a United Nations Messenger of Peace and an honorary member of the World Future Council. And now, happily, as I mentioned, a member of the Starmus Advisory Board. With her talk, Reasons for Hope, please welcome the legendary Jane Goodall. Well, thank you for a fantastic welcome. And I think you deserve a rather different kind of welcome than has ever been heard here before. The call that you would hear, the welcome from the chimpanzees that I spent so much of my time learning about. <laughs> Me, Jane. <laughs> Well, first of all, I'm very honored to be here at this Starmus Earth. It's the first time I've attended. I'm very honored to have been invited onto the advisory board. And I'm particularly thrilled that this year's Starmus is concentrating on our home planet, one of the maybe billions and billions of planets that are out there in the cosmos. But isn't it fascinating that it's because of our exploration into space that we got that first stunning image of our own planet Earth, that beautiful green and blue planet from, taken from space. And then I think people began to realize this is a very fragile planet. And there we are spinning around the sun, a very small, planets surrounded by the black, dark immensity of outer space. And I think that was a wake-up call. It was a wake-up call for people on Earth to realize this is our only home. We'd better start protecting the planet. And over the ages, probably since the Industrial Revolution, maybe since the Agricultural Revolution, we have slowly been inflicting more and more harm upon this planet, our only home. And with our burning of fossil fuels and all the other things that we've done to create those greenhouse gases, those gases that circle the planet like a blanket and trap the heat of the sun that's led to climate change. And climate change is inseparable from loss of biodiversity. And with climate change, we've seen these terrifying changes in weather patterns around the world. Worse and more frequent storms and hurricanes and flooding and droughts and heat waves and the terrifying forest fires that we have seen in so many parts of the globe, including up in the, in the, in the northern areas where fires never learned, be, be burnt before. And we've seen glaciers and ice melting. We've seen sea levels rising. We've seen the methane leaking out from the ground that was frozen for thousands and thousands of years. And there are so many other ways in which we've harmed this planet. Climate change isn't something that we're facing in the future. Climate change is here, here and now. 
not only in places like Bangladesh and low-lying countries, but in the, in the more economically developed countries. We've seen terrible flooding in London and in New York and in parts of Europe as well. And then there's the loss of biodiversity. We are in the midst of the sixth great extinction on planet Earth, and this one was caused by us. And we are at a very, very difficult point in time. And what we do now is going to affect the future of life on planet Earth. And I see us as like at the mouth of a very long and very dark tunnel. And right at the end of that tunnel is a little star shining. That's hope. But we don't sit at the mouth of the tunnel with our arms crossed and hope the star will come to us. No, we have to roll up our sleeves. We have to climb over, crawl under, work our way around all the obstacles that lie between us and that star. And there are the obvious ones like climate change and loss of biodiversity that I've mentioned. And I think we mostly know the reasons for that. And Industrial agriculture with its huge use of fossil fuel, its use of chemical pesticides and herbicides and artificial fertilizer that are having a dramatic effect on biodiversity and actually killing the very soil on which we depend. And the, the artificial fertilizers went washed down into the rivers and out into the sea, are causing dead zones where nothing can live. We can't go on like this, can we? And there are so many other uh, problems that we face as we go navigate through this tunnel. There's the intensive farming of animals. And there we have to think not only of the harm to the environment, which is huge, but the cruelty, the cruelty involved. And you know, it was really because of those early studies that I did on chimpanzees that have helped to change attitudes towards what, who animals really are. When I got to Cambridge University in 1961, I was actually told that only human beings had personalities, only human beings had minds capable of solving problems, and only human beings had emotions like happiness, sadness, fear. Fortunately, I'd been taught by an amazing teacher when I was a child that in this respect, these scientists were wrong. That teacher, that was my dog, Rusty. You can't share your life with any animal and not know that we are not the only sentient, sapient beings on the planet. So we now understand that cows, pigs, goats, sheep, chickens, they all are individuals with personalities. So when we think about intensive animal farming, let us please also think about cruelty. Let us think that we now understand we are part of and not separate from this amazing animal kingdom. And of course, all the time, we're learning more and more details about exactly how amazing these animals are. Then we have to climb over or crawl under poverty. People living in poverty, they destroy the environment in their desperate struggle to survive, cutting down the trees to make money or to grow food for their starving families. And until we can alleviate poverty, we can never have a world where people decide only to buy products that haven't harmed the environment or weren't cruel to animals, because poor people cannot make those decisions. But the rest of us, we can do something about our unsustainable lifestyles. And how is it possible, as economists have thought, that we can have unlimited economic development on a planet with finite natural resources and growing populations of humans and livestock. It doesn't make sense. We have to have a new way of thinking, a new mindset. And then we also have to consider uh, corruption, which is destroying the efforts of so many people to make change. 
And now we have war, two major wars, conflicts across Africa, conflict in other parts of the world, harming the environment, causing horrible suffering to so many hundreds and thousands of human beings. We've got racial and gender discrimination, so much to overcome. Good news, there are people, groups of people, tackling every single one of these problems, those I've mentioned, and all the many that I haven't. Sadly, so many of these groups are working in isolation. They're not thinking of the whole picture. They solve one problem, and they're not thinking about other problems which they may be causing. Like electric cars, amazing, solving pollution and all that. But they need, the batteries need lithium, and huge areas of environment are now being destroyed to find lithium during mining. So people say to me, Jane, you've seen so many of these problems. Do you really have hope? And I do. I believe we have a window of time. But when I say I have hope, it depends on us. We have to get together and try to make a difference. We mustn't leave it to others. It's up to us. But my main reasons for hope, first of all, there's science. And many of the scientists are here and have been here at the Starmus events. Science is beginning to find ways using this amazing intellect that makes us more different than anything else from chimpanzees and other animals beginning to use that intellect to create ways in which we can live in greater harmony with nature. And this is evolving all the time. And there will be other people speaking to you about the benefits of our intellect and our new technologies that can help. But we too, as individuals, please let us think about our own environmental footsteps each day each day, every single one of us can make a difference. And so my next reason for hope is the resilience of nature. We can destroy places, and given time and perhaps some help, nature will return. I gather the Danube, which was so horribly polluted in Soviet times, is gradually beginning to recover, although it may take a long time. But all over the world, I have seen with my own eyes places that were totally destroyed by us, where nature has come back, and with the first grasses, and then the trees growing from seeds left in the ground, the insects come back, and the birds, and the other mammals, and gradually biodiversity returns. Maybe not exactly the same, but it becomes once again a living, thriving ecosystem. And my, I, I've, I've met animals that should have been extinct if it wasn't for amazing people saying, no, I will not let the northern bald ibis go extinct in my watch. I will not let the, the New Zealand black robin become extinct. There were just two birds left, one male and one female. And because of the passion of one man, there's now over 150. And so it's incredible what we can do. And there is this indomitable spirit where people tackle what seems impossible and they won't give up. But my greatest reason for hope lies in the young people today. And back in 1991, when I was meeting so many young people, high school, university, who already back then had lost hope, and they were angry or they were depressed or mostly just apathetic, they didn't seem to care. And when I asked them, why do you feel this way? Well, you've compromised our future and there's nothing we can do about it. Have we compromised the future of our young people? <laughs> We've been stealing it and we're still stealing it today. But was it true there was nothing they could do? No, I've already said there's this window of time when if we get together, we can truly make a difference. Roots and Shoots, the program I began, is for young people from kindergarten through university with more adults taking part. It began with 12 students in Tanzania, high school students. It's now in 70 countries with, as I say, people of all ages, even adults now are forming groups, and it's growing here in Slovakia. 
And these young people, once they understand the problems and we empower them to take action, and Roots and Shoots is all about empowering young people, listening to their voices. And it's incredible. They are changing the world, even as I speak to you today. But the last thing I would say to all of you, please don't forget, you as an individual have a role to play. You're on this planet for a reason, I believe. And every single day that you live, you make some impact on the planet. People say to me, but Jane, I'm just one person. The problems are huge. What can I do? It's, it's like, think of a desert. One drop of rain falls. That won't make any difference. But when millions or billions of raindrops fall, that wakes up the life lying hidden beneath the sand, and it comes and blooms, and the desert comes to life. That's what our young people can do. That's what all of you can do. Just remember, cumulatively, we can change the world. Thank you.